Nevertheless, I am Mr. Betts, and I feel like death warmed over. That's why I'm drinking tea, but it doesn't matter because you have a Gilded Age test in 10 minutes. And what is the Gilded Age? If you're asking yourself, don't worry, I have you covered. In the next 10 minutes, we're gonna go over 50 terms, people, and events that you're gonna need to know for your Gilded Age test. And I know, I always say it's 10 minutes. It never is, but we're gonna do it this time because I have a green screen. Let's do it. The Gilded Age is what we call the period between post-Civil War up until the early 1900s. It's marked by two main traits, industrialization and urbanization, and it couldn't have been done without the transcontinental railroad and railroads in general. During this time, there's a massive expansion of railroads in America, the most famous of which being the transcontinental railroad, which finally links the Atlantic to the Pacific, Somebody should make a video about that. Cornelius Vanderbilt was probably the most famous of the railroad barons, a small group that controlled the nation's railroads, and he couldn't have done this without the Bessemer process, a new way of making strong steel that could be used for the rails. George Westinghouse invented new air brakes for those trains, and George Pullman and his Pullman Palace cars provided the rich with a luxurious way to travel. When his cars weren't catching on fire and thus turning into luxurious death traps. More on Pullman later. The Grange was a farmer's movement that grew in response to the overwhelming power of the railroad and their shipping fees, and it led to the Interstate Commerce Commission. Passed in Congress in 1887 and required the railroads to charge and publish reasonable and just rates. This also increased the power of the federal government over the states. Telegrams introduced by Samuel Morse also connected the nation. Thousands of telegraph lines using Morse code allowed for basic but instantaneous communication. And the transatlantic cable late in 1886 finally allowed the new and the old world to communicate in real time. So we're more connected. It's time to industrialize. And in order to do that, we're gonna need the three factors of production. The first factor is land and not just the land, but all the resources that are on and in it. Next is labor or the people that do the actual work. And the last factor is capital. Whether whether it be funds or tools or facilities to actually have industry. Now, if you have all of these three together, you might just become one of the robber barons or captains of industry, depending on who you ask. Andrew Carnegie became one of these through the Carnegie Steel Company and vertical integration, in which he acquired companies for every stage of production. I want to say Carnegie. It's Carnegie Hall. I'm from New York. You say Carnegie Hall. John D. Rockefeller, whose Standard Oil Company came to dominate the oil industry, he favored horizontal integration in which you just buy or push out all of your competition for a product. And if this sounds like monopoly in which a company owns like the entire industry, well, that's because it was. How were companies able to do this? Well, many became corporations or a company that sells shares called stocks to stockholders. Selling those shares give companies more capital, AKA money to produce. And if it does well, the shareholders will earn dividends or their share of the profit. The Sherman Antitrust Act was passed to try to rein in some of those monopolistic corporations, but uh, let's just say somebody should make a video about that. Still some good comes out of this. The gospel of wealth written by old Carnegie himself becomes a full of philosophy that says that these self-made men have a responsibility to redistribute their wealth through philanthropy. And Carnegie put his money where his mouth was. In today's dollars, he gave out $200 billion. Billion dollars. Carnegie, can I get a dime? The social gospel was a religiously motivated movement that tried to improve industrial society through charity and settlement houses and labor reforms. And then you have social Darwinism that said, whatever with all of that, the rich are rich and the poor are poor because of natural selection and the fact that some races are just biologically superior to others. That's racist! Yeah, I know. Alexander Graham Bell invents the telephone and not the graham cracker. You don't want to know how that was invented. George Eastman's Kodak camera helps bring photography to the masses. Thomas Edison, the wizard of Menlo Park, he invents everything from the phonograph to the motion picture machine to the storage battery to the light bulb. Kind of. Still, if we're going to talk war of the currents, I'm going to take my boy Nikola Tesla and his alternating current AC. 
Guy was like a real life mad scientist. Look him up. You have George Washington Carver who comes up with like a million different uses for the peanuts. And the reason he's doing this is he wants to help the South move away from being a cotton economy, which totally depletes the soil and keeps people poor. Speaking of poor and tired and huddled masses, you have the new immigrants, this massive influx of people coming to America in the 1800s and a crucial part of the Gilded Age. Somebody should make a video about that. Ellis Island and Angel Island were government processing centers for these immigrants. The New York-based Ellis Island for those coming from Southern and Eastern Europe and Angel Island in California for those coming from Asia. The Statue of Liberty, a gift from France, is unveiled in 1886 and becomes a symbol of hope and opportunity to these new immigrants. Here's an Easter egg for you. Did you know at her feet there are broken chains that you're never gonna get to see because they're at her feet. You're always looking up. You Kind of seems like a lot of work for nothing. Emma Lazarus and her poem, The New Colossus, are used to help raise money for the pedestal that the statue is on. Yeah, for a while, we're like, friends, it's really nice, but where are we going to put it? The poem by Lazarus with lines like, give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Those lines have become as famous as, we the people, or do you know the way? Do you know the way? What is this, a meme story? You can buy them on this beautiful refugee towel from the Radical Tea Towel Company. Link down in the description. Little plug in the middle of review. If that's the thing that prevents me from making 10 minutes. Political machines, powerful organizations like Boss, Boss, Boss Tweed's Tammany Hall in New York welcome these immigrants, or more specifically, their easily manipulated votes. The Chinese Exclusion Act is passed as nativism swells and it shuts down immigration from China. The Immigration Act of 1917 would later follow targeting those who don't speak the English a good. Still millions of immigrants came to America, many settling in cities where they could gaze at the skyscrapers designed by architects like Lewis Sullivan. Chicago's home insurance building is generally thought to be the first skyscraper with its 10 floors. 10 floors? Man is not meant to be that high. Frederick Law Olmsted designed incredible recreational spaces like New York Central Park or Chicago's World Fair Fairgrounds, but chances are if you lived in the city, you lived in a tenement. Or super rundown apartment buildings with incredible features like multiple families just crammed into every space and maybe a working bathroom on every floor? Ugh. Still not all was bad. You had the Hull House created by reformer Jane Addams that taught immigrants English, provided care for working mothers, and generally helped newcomers adjust to life in American cities. Public schools multiplied at least at the primary levels with reformers like John Dewey advocating that learning should be done through discovery and interest and not rote memorization. Whatever. Booker T. Washington talked about education and advancement for African Americans. Later he would clash with W.E.B. Du Bois. Somebody should make a video about that. Suburbs, thanks to commuter railways, provided a residential alternative for those that liked city jobs, but not city life. Subways or underground railroads, no, like uh, actual underground railroads, uh, first seen in Boston and later expanding to New York and Philadelphia, allowed urbanites to live farther and farther away from their jobs. Speaking of jobs, you may be working 10 plus hours in a sweatshop. These were factories that featured monotonous yet hazardous work in really unsafe conditions. Trade unions or groups of skilled workers began to form and more importantly consolidate to fight unfair practices and working conditions. They were not well received. The Knights of Labor were an early union that tried to include all workers, skilled and unskilled, men and women, white and black, and they had some early successes, such as getting eight hour work shifts, and that was until the Haymarket Riot, which was initially a strike in Chicago until somebody threw a bomb and bedlam ensued. This was the beginning of the end of the Knights of Labor, and it didn't help the fact that most of their ranks were unskilled laborers that could easily be replaced. Another strike, the Homestead strike at Carnegie's Homestead plant in Philadelphia, saw managers bring in Pinkertons and the clash between them and the workers left many dead. The Pullman strike was against working conditions for those making the luxurious death traps that were George Pullman's rail cars, and it temporarily crippled rail traffic nationwide. The government actually obtained an injunction that formally made that strike illegal. But in the long run, we wound up getting Labor Day out of it, so 
Not all bad. You then you had the American Federation of Labor led by Samuel Gompers. It admitted skilled labor only and used collective bargaining in which the union officials will represent all of the workers in negotiations with management. Now, if you needed a break from all of this work, you could attend some vaudeville, which were variety shows that had singers and dancers and magicians and strongmen and actors and jugglers and minstrels. We could probably do without the minstrels. That's crazy! You could pick up a newspaper and read some yellow journalism, which was sensationalized, biased, and sometimes flat out fake news, the most famous of which put out by publishers William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. It was fun. Even if it starts a war every now and then, somebody should make a video out of that. Or you could read Mark Twain, who is the author of this age. What with hits like Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, the period itself is named from one of his quotes. The golden gleam of the gilded surface hides the cheapness of the metal underneath. Did I make it? Yes! Yes! Green screen for life! We did it! Ten minutes! <coughs> I'm dying! You just got 50 terms, events, and people that you're gonna need to know to ace your Gilded Age test. Remember, if you like that tea towel with the new Colossus poem for refugees, you can get it from the Radical Tea Towel Company. Link down in my description. I also want to thank Mr. Ciccone. Mr. Chacon, I don't know how to say his name, but he sent me this awesome uh, President Garfield shirt. Didn't get a chance to work him in to the 50, but wanted to highlight it. Much appreciated. If you like what I'm doing down here, click the button that lets me know. Leave a comment down below and consider supporting Mr. Bat's class on Patreon. Patreon is the service where you can pledge as little as a dollar a month to help me make these videos free for everyone forever and earn some awesome perks along the way. Make Make sure you subscribe because we have a long way till the end of the year, but we're going to get through it together. Be safe and I'll see you next time.